so hopefully it works. Well, hello everyone. This was my school back in the 80s, and um, I kept in contact with uh, Darling Goto here. And we talk all the time, and uh, it would be kind of fun to come back and kind of share the stuff I do uh, at work. But uh, kind of the core of my education was here. I learned everything here uh, at the art classes. And um, I never went to art center or anything after that. I was more ambitious than uh, educated, so I kind of got in that way. And um, it was funny because I got most of my work drawing because my style was different. Almost everyone in the movie industry goes to art center or design schools of that nature. And pretty much all, though their work is brilliant, it, it has a look that really looks a lot alike. And so, ironically, I'd have a lot of people go, oh, I like this because it looks a little bit different. And that's kind of how I got my foot in back in 85. And um, what I brought today is kind of a, an overall uh, design sense from sketches up to production drawings up to the finished piece in the film. And if we have time, I'll show you the whole slideshow plus some excerpts from Star Trek Nemesis, which kind of goes over the whole gambit. You'll see from set design to props to sets to lighting, the whole ordeal. And uh, if anyone loves art, the motion picture industry is the greatest place to be because every day is something different, every day is something new. And you're constantly learning because you have these fabulous people around you, these incredible talents that you just look at and go, oh, I'm so impressed by these. Work. I'm a fan every day when I go to work. And Star Trek's kind of an isolated community, art-wise. Um, it's usually me and maybe one other guy, and that's about it. So it's fun to break out into other films and kind of see what the other guys are doing. And so I mostly read about other artists I'm a huge fan of, and it's always a great treat to meet a few of them. Some of the shows in here I'll, I'll show you. So if you like, I know our time isn't, isn't that long for the presentation, so I'll get right into it. And I'll sit down if you don't mind, so I can work this in. And so the first show we have is going to be Star Trek Nemesis. And um, if you're familiar with the film, it was the latest one that came out last December. And the script written by John Logan was a beautiful, brilliant, brilliant script. And as time went on, the script kind of filtered down to fit that two-hour time slot, so the real powerful impact of the script kind of wasted away. So it would have been an outstanding film. It was kind of a mediocre show, but the design work that everyone did on the show was just about outstanding. I think it was one of the finer achievements that the Star Trek films had to offer. And back in 1980 or 95, we did Star Trek First Contact, and it was the first movie where we were going to have a brand new Enterprise. And so my boss came to me and goes, we need a new version of the Enterprise, which would be the version E, and they're alphabetical. And the old Captain Kirk days, back on the TV show, it was just considered the Enterprise. And as the films progressed, they started adding the, uh, the numericals to uh, indicate different phases of the ship. So what we have here is the final approved drawing of the Enterprise E. And it took maybe 50, 60 sketches to get one that I was happy with. And after I presented that, then it goes through the whole kind of approval procedure where uh, the producers will say one thing and the art director will be another. And so they pretty much let me keep the design intact. And if you're familiar with the show, the Enterprise prior to this had very, very short engines. And I thought the balance didn't work. I worked in the model shop at the time. And I thought if I ever did an Enterprise, I'd balance it more. So uh, from a, photo a photographic point of view, you could film it from more angles. And the, the uh, Enterprise D was really limited on how you could film it. And so being in that model shop, you kind of saw something different from an art point of view. So this was the, uh, the Enterprise E from First Contact. And in Nemesis, we had to change a few things. From First Contact, the whole point of the ship was to be kind of attacking from the bottom of the ship. In Nemesis, they were going to be attacked from the top, according to the script. And so we didn't really have a lot of armament on the top, so we had to kind of modify the ship a bit so it could handle what the, the story had been written for. And so we had to add all kinds of weaponry and all kinds of new devices. So I just took some existing sketches and kind of changed them a little bit and added more weaponry to, uh, to balance out what needed to be done. And what was funny is in First Contact, it was still a time when they used actual physical models for photography. It's all digital now. You won't see a miniature unless it's for an explosion or something. And after I saw the model done, for the Enterprise E, I thought, wow, if I could change that a little bit, I would too. And Nemesis opened the door so I could do that. And it's not too often you can go back and change a design you start with. And with this one, uh, this is the, the, the later version, but before this, everything was kind of squatty. And so they gave me a chance to kind of open up the, the spaces and the negativity and, 
kind of put it into a more sleeker, faster kind of profile. And one of the fun things about the show is you, you're constantly, well, with the Star Trek anyways, it's such a small art department, like I was saying, you really go, get to go back and kind of find home what you, what you uh, created or worked on. And Star Trek's one of the only shows that really allows that. There's such a big art department on other shows that um, your time on one project is done. If you're doing like a building or a boat, you do your part of it, pass it on, and the next guy takes over and does his share of the details. So this one kind of opens up quite a big door for, for uh, taking something from start to finish. This was the, uh, the beauty shot of the ship. This was the final, final version that went over to Digital Domain. And they were the effects company that built the ship. And a guy named Jay uh, Barton works over there. And so he meticulously put the ship together. And what we had to come up with is damage, what the ship would look like in different damage phases. So we take stuff with the rim, and this was just all kind of examples for them to see what it would look like after a heavy attack. And there's a particular scene in the film where the Enterprise has a head-on with the bad guy in space. And so this is actually version W. It actually took probably 10 versions, but at that point you're kind of tired, so you just put these uh, kind of crazy uh, numbers at the end just to say this is my 20th version or my 30th version. <laughs> and what we have here is the first shot of the computer model. And so if you didn't know, it's where it was an actual model. These guys do such incredible, incredible work. So here's the first part of the saucer. And from the detail point of view, you can see they covered it. If you had seen first contact it, and compared to Nemesis, there's a very distinct line between motion control, model photography, and CG. And when you're in the digital world, there's no boundary on how the ship can move. But in motion control, there's always a mount holding the model, so you can only do so much, and you couldn't do full 360 degree shots. And with this digital world, everything can go anywhere. And so the modeling is usually the tricky part, but these guys really pulled out quite an amazing job. These are some more versions of the ship. And with every Star Trek show, there's a new captain's chair. And so I think I've done like <laughs> nine or ten of them right now. And this one, they were going to introduce seat belts. It's always been the running joke for Star Trek. Why don't they have seat belts? And so when they did it, it looked corny, so they decided to leave it off so there was no seat belts. But on the kind of gray version off to the right, that was kind of the way the, the seat belt assembly came together. And this was our bad guy. He was called the Scimitar. And they wanted something that the writer had written where he wanted it to be a very menacing, dark-looking ship, but it was going to open up into a, a sort of spider kind of looking aggressiveness when it, was, when it was open and ready to fire. And going back to Star Trek history, I had to do a lot of research because it's a new group of aliens we're seeing called the Raymond, and they're a sister planet to Romulus, which is, there's a, a big story going behind it. And so I kind of borrowed architecture from the Romulan world, but made it more aggressive for the Raymond world. And this is the uh, sketch for the ship, and here's some very detailed drawings. And with the digital guys, this is all they really like. They like they, some of them like literal top, side, and back views, while other guys that are more confident with their modeling, they want to be creative as well. So we'll collaborate, and I'll just give them what they need. And this was just a sketch they asked for to see what the, the front looked like. This here is kind of a rear version of the detail. My producers wanted to see this. And um, there's, there's a little kind of oval on the back there. And in the script it read that this weapon that they use is this very dangerous weapon and it was enormous to go like the room of a football stadium. And so these are the variations that show how it would open up. And so it was enormous, like I was saying, but when it came out to budget regions, they had to do it as set probably the size of the corner of this room. And uh, we'll see a little bit of that in the film when we get, the, get that far. But usually they want you to draw as grand as you can, and budget will kind of determine what you get to see, or what they're going to build. And here's one of the versions of the actual ship with the head on with the Enterprise. And there's another version so you can kind of see the scale of the two ships. And this entire image is all uh, done in light wave, which is the digital kind of format that the modeler is like. And so the planet's all done. Everything in the shot has been created in the computer. And um, say anywhere from three or four years from now, it's, it, you'll never know the difference between reality and, and what is computer. They're doing such an amazing job of it. Here's another view for scale. And this is the one of the points I was talking about, the, the big head-on crash. And so. 
trying to film these two ships crash together was, was very difficult for the uh, effects team to figure out how they were going to put them together. And so I did a uh, handful of sketches their group did. And I wanted to be in something they could only solve in the computer test models. Because with drawing, you know, you're, you're pretty much stuck with a static two-dimensional two drawing. But with the 3D, they did little rough models and they could move and rotate at really good angles to show the crash. And there's another scene of it. And that's it with the wings open that I was talking about when it goes to fire its major weapon, which was called the Thaleron. And in the film version, they slowly open up. It takes about 10 minutes to have this whole process open. So in the next couple frames, you'll kind of see how it starts slowly, slowly starting to open. And in the film, they never really get to the point where it's completely open and you get a good view of it. And so you kind of see in stages that it explodes far before it gets there ready to. But um, when it's all open up, the producers go, it needs one more little piece of action. And so they decided, they go, it looks kind of like a gun getting ready to shoot, but it's not that far to go. So they go, let's have something on each wingtip that will open up and say it gets ready, it's ready to fire. And so we came up with this little kind of triggering, focusing device that will come out of each wing and will open up and kind of do a, a focusing trick. And with this next couple sequences here, you'll see this piece open. So you see the kind of foreground beam in front of you. It splits and this kind of silvery device comes out. And it opens up like a spider as well. And um, you see the energy kind of form in the back and it's, it's ready to go. And so all these little tidbits of extra action kind of, kind of take a story to a point where you don't have dialogue going up, but you have a visual reference to it. This ship here was the Romulan ship, and the last one we had done was for the old television series, The Next Generation. And so I borrowed a couple elements, but made it more into a graceful, graceful bird, which is kind of what their, their kind of design element was. They always use uh, birds of prey as a reference. So this was called the Baldor, and they liked the sketch right away, so very little extra sketches I had to do. This one got approved pretty quickly. Usually in a design sense, when you're doing the concept design, it takes anywhere from 1 to 20 to 30 sketches to get something that they'll approve. It just depends on what they want to see. This one, the modeler wanted more of the plans like I was talking about, so I gave him some side views, some tops, and, and some, uh, some details on all the elements that uh, put the ship together. And here's some of the versions of the film. And in the action, we're actually in this kind of nebula. They called it the, what did they call this thing? It wasn't really the expanse. They kind of did this kind of column of gas and, and stuff to kind of light the ships. It was, the ships were basically dark. And so they came up with the idea of putting them in this galaxy, this nebula, so to say, so they could actually play against each other and you could see them moving. But the, the emphasis on the, on the ships was they were very dark colored and moving on space. All you could see is highlights, so that's where the background came to play. Here's another shot of the ship kind of rolling over the camera. And this drawing is probably the most important drawing of any science fiction show. And putting a scale to things um, and establishing that scale helps everyone from the production department to the set designers to the effects guys. And without this, the Production usually goes a lot because you don't know what the scale of things are going to be. So we try and make this our very first sketch and have the producers sign off on it. And because every time they go, we want to change this shot or change that shot, they go, oh, we can't change the scale and here's your signature on the, on the drawing. So <laughs> having that locked in stone helps everybody outside of the production office. And we had a version of torture chairs. We had to come up with there's a blood transfusion kind of thing with the bad guy and the good guy. And uh, they wanted something very gothic, very Frankenstein-ish show. This was uh, one of the earlier sketches that kind of showed that, um, that dark gothic look. This was a fun one. We needed a, a new shuttle for the show. And almost every other movie we do a new shuttle, and Laura was kind of fun to look forward to doing it. And this one had a whole scene where it's flying through the desert, and it's going to drop off a truck called the Argo truck. And so what we did here is came up with a ship that um, kind of is compact when it flies through space, as you can see in these couple drawings, and there's the back door for the truck, but when it did atmospheric traveling, I thought it'd be kind of fun to have the wings open up. So what you have on the back there is these four little wing units that are part of the ship, and they, they hinge out and fold out. And here's a shot where it's flying out of the Enterprise. And working with the digital domain guys, they asked a lot of questions that uh, most effects companies don't do, and they said, hey, how does the shuttle exit the ship? Is it like an airlock where they, where they evacuate all the people? open the doors or what do they do? And so we kind of came with this idea that let's have it fly through a force field so you don't have to evacuate the chamber. So that's where you see the little 
little ship coming out of the little fizzle around it down there in the center of the frame. And here's a shot out in the desert. This is out by Edwards Air Force Base. And they bleached the film to kind of give it an alien look. But here has the wings down, comes down to land. And this whole sequence was just, just perfect. You're looking at it and the CGI just did incredible matching live action with the computer model of the ship. Here's a shot of it in the air. And next we had the Argo truck we had to come up with then. It was kind of new for Star Trek to have vehicles, and it, in a way it goes against the Star Trek future, having something wheel-based. And so we had to find something we could turn into something Star Trek-y, but still, still function because they had to use this out in the desert. So this was the very first version we did, and they wanted a tail gunner in the back. And so we kind of designed this, found a pro truck that we could use and strip down and build this framework around it. Um, the problem was the back was uh, kind of unprotected for one of the actors, so we changed and put a framework around where he sits. And so sometimes these little changes will come in. This one went through pretty quick with approval also. Nemesis was kind of a hit and miss, and the little things went through approval quickly while, like the big scimitar bad guy ship, that one took the longest amount. So the whole process with the, with the film approval wise is anywhere from probably six months in the art department. And you're kind of drawing through the production, keeping these things going. Are you taking questions? Yeah, yeah, I was going to. Uh, how do you get your instructions as to what to do? Does, does someone give you, do you talk it through? Do you guys meet together in a group and do sketches? Or is, uh, did, did, did you work on the sketch just all by yourself? Or was there you know, a, a group? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll explain that a little bit more, too. He was uh, curious on how the design process goes. And I'll get a script and I'll go through it and either the writer will be very confident of what he wants to see or he'll be vague and leave it up to the art department. And with Logan, he was very specific with things and very vague on others. And so when it says off-road vehicle, um, I used to work at the model shop, so having that practical hands-on education um, kind of limits how I'm going to draw. So my first thing was to meet with the transportation coordinator and see what kind of vehicle he was looking for and what we could do with it. So it was kind of collaboration between my department and the actual people that were going to build the, the physical truck. So first we found a truck we were going to use, and um, my first question was called the company that produced them to see what the framework looked like and what I could do to it. And so most of the time I'll design around what I think the producers want to see, and that's kind of my guiding point. I'll send sketches over yes or no, and that's kind of how I get feedback. And with this one, it was pretty much completely designed, and the approval was easy because it, it fit everyone's needs when it went through that production end. And what you have here is the physical truck in the bottom and the CG ship flying above it. And it was a real nice marrying of the two elements. And five, six years ago, you'd never been able to pull this shot off. Uh, with the digital compositing now, you can bounce the film, the camera bounce, everything with your effects. So, uh, five years ago, this ship would have been smooth and the background would have been bumpy, so it would have been really obvious what the two elements would have been, but they're really beginning to marry things in remarkable ways. This was kind of the Hollywood moment at the show, where the truck's in danger and it doesn't jump off the cliff into the back of the ship. Yeah. And when I read it, I go, oh my gosh, this is the silliest thing in the world. But in the shot, they actually added so much weight and bounce when the vehicle hits the back of the ship, it drops. So you have all this gravity and physical, physical effects going on that most people wouldn't have thought about, but the digital guys were constantly trying to make things look real, even if it was kind of hokey in the way it was written. <laughs> and from the cockpit point of view, if this is the interior of the truck, we had come up with a whole futuristic dash. And there wasn't a lot of room to work with because it was a pro truck and a racing truck. Most of the assembly inside is framework. So this is kind of designed to fit around what was existing in the truck. And um, the co-pilot, Data, if you're familiar with that character, he's kind of a cyborg character. He remotely pilots the, the flying ship for the jump sequence. And this is his little device where he pulls out the remote and controls the ship. And in turn, we had, bad, had to have bad guy vehicles. And I so wanted to go with the George Miller Road Warrior and Mad Max look. And they, they wouldn't let me go it, so I, I went for with the camouflage over uh, real barbaric designs. And these were the two bad guy trucks that we used in the film. And they were also built around existing dune buggies. This was one of the funner ships. This was called the Scorpion. And this is the very, very early version of the fighter that actually is housed inside the bad guy's scimitar ship. And the producers saw this, and the whole sequence was that the ship's going to fly through the interior of the ship to escape. 
And they looked at this and they thought it was a little bit too big, and I based it on a scorpion, the actual scorpion with the claws, and the gun was the stinger on the back. And what they liked was the little module where the, where the seats were. They always say, just use that and lose the wings. And that was another version with the wings. And I said, okay, let's give it a go. So that is the back part of that wing ship. And so we went from there, and usually with Star Trek uh, shows, uh, we always use flat glass for the windows, it's just because it's cheaper and it's quicker to do. And JAG, the TV show JAG, is Paramount production, and I know they use the F-18 jets, and I've seen the Fargo has canopies around. I go, what do you say we get one of those canopies and flip it backwards and break that Star Trek mold that we got them on the lot? And so it would be something we could probably acquire. So we researched getting those canopies first, got those, and then we went ahead with the design using the rounded windows as opposed to, to flat. This here was the final version. Uh, I was working with one of the set designers on this, and he was one of the guys that designed the spinners for Blade Runner, Sid Mead. And so we together worked on this one, came up with this final version of the ship, and the interior as well. And when we came up with it, oh, so this is the gun that kind of says Scorpion. I tried to design it as a stinger tail on a Scorpion. And here's the computer version of it. The effects guys built this practical on stage out of wood that buy rounded wood from um, uh, I think it was the Philippines they got it from, where they, they uh, water soak wood, uh, big sheets of wood, and they uh, send it in different diameters of, of curvature. So they built this entire thing out of wood over about an eight month period. And it's only on the screen for maybe 20 seconds. And then it just was taken over by the CG model for all the flying sequences. And here's one of the scenes where it's flying and it getting ready to blow through the bay. One of the final versions we heard, designs we had to do for the set, was the space dock. And that's kind of a an icon with the Star Trek films is the ship is always up in space in this open framework so you can see them working on it. And by the end of the film, it's, it's destroyed pretty bad, the Enterprise. And so this is the space dock where it's going to go. Uh, usually it's a giant box, and any, it looks like any Enterprise can fit in it. For, for Nemesis, I wanted it to be, let me see if I'm going the right way, I wanted it to be more custom fit to the Enterprise E, which is a very kind of sleek departure from the typical Enterprise. So. This uh, space dock actually fits the ship more custom as opposed to any ship could be docked in it. Here's one of the scenes with the Enterprise in the dock. Here's another view. So it's more form-fitting. I thought it was kind of nice the way it, it came apart as the, uh, the film went along. And they always have these little vehicles called worker bees for background action. So if you're looking out a window, um, your first thought is, oh, it's just a static piece of film out there. So when you see something go by the window, it kind of gives you the illusion that I'm not looking at a picture out of a window. It's actually some, some functioning structure outside. And these were some of the little background rig vehicles you'd see. And um, while I was doing Nemesis, I worked on Enterprise at the same time. And so this is kind of the, the beginning of Enterprise. It's, it's a very big departure from the old Star Trek shows. It's, it's not really a, a child-oriented show by any means, because <laughs> we have this Bulk and gal on the show, and she doesn't wear much hardly ever. And so, uh, so my kids don't watch that show. <laughs> but anyways, we had to do an open opening sequence, and they wanted to do something different as opposed to just the main hero ship flying through. So they show a history of avionics and, and flipper ships and stuff. And, but we came to a point from where Star Trek history ends to uh, the future, so we had to fill in the gaps. And so this is one of the. Federation ships that we designed that was to bridge that gap between like Chuck Yeager up to the Enterprise era. And um, this is what we have here is we needed a shuttle. And why they had very little use of the shuttle in the old television show, it was, it was too expensive and that's why they came up with the beaming, where they beamed a planet to planet. It was a budgetary reason and that kind of set the standard for where this show was going to go, but they wanted to go before Captain Kirk, so we went back to the shuttle craft era. And this was kind of based roughly on, a, on one of the Edwards dropships that they're testing, the X-33 the and the X-38. So it's kind of a mix of all those ships together. And when I showed the producers this, this is one they liked almost immediately, but they thought it had too many wings. So they had me drop the top wings and kind of spread the bottom ones down. So drawing-wise, this was approved, but construction, when it was done, they had to make room for the cockpit and all that stuff. It was kind of, it almost looks like a shoe. And when they're parked in the shuttle bay on the set, we walk by and they look like two Dutch clogging shoes, so <laughs> that's kind of their nickname on the set. And again, here's another captain's chair, and this one we had to antiquate to with push buttons and, uh, 
and more stuff that would be more our era as opposed to the uh, next generation era. And so it's more mechanical chair. There's a lot of adjustments on it that they can do all kinds of stuff. So it's always kind of fun. And what was hard about this show is you're with the uh, Nemesis and the next generation thing years, 200 years in the future. And you're doing a future show, so you're doing future things. But with Enterprise, you're doing still the future, but the future's past. So it's kind of a bizarre concept. I think you're doing the, something prehistorical, Star Trek wise, but it's still our future and their past. So you're in this, this crazy idea of trying to figure out what, what it's going to look like. And, and uh, my production designer, Boss Herman Zimmerman, he kind of came up with the idea with these particular push button things that aren't typically what you see today, but uh, a departure from it in the future. And what's funny is everything that you'd see that was really cool and futuristic in the old television show, we have now cell phones, and, and they're even thinner than the Captain Kirk stuff. So it's kind of a, a bizarre thing to draw a future when what we have today is, is far more futuristic than what we designed. And here we have one of the consoles which is based very lightly on the old uh, Captain Kirk era. Same with this. This was kind of a situation table sits in the background. And so on this show, I did more of the designs for the bridge and the interior as, the, as opposed to the exterior. Uh, Doug Drexler was the guy that designed the MX-01 for the Enterprise show. And my boss wanted me more to help him with the interiors and um, the sets that go with that with the bad guys stuff. What we have here is a ready room, which is a room off the bridge, where the captain kind of goes and contemplates what he has to do. And they wanted some existing art on the walls, and this was a request I got on a Thursday night, and they needed it Friday morning. So the next board drawing, I actually did five, and they wanted to see a clipper ship version of the Enterprise, a space shuttle, aircraft carrier, all the way up to our new ship. And so these drawings here depict what we did real quick for the, for the back wall. You ever see the, the show, they're kind of in the back of this ready room under glass. And this was the hardest one because every picture I found of the Enterprise aircraft carrier was full of planes and you can never see the deck. And so as closely as I could kind of figure the outline too to what the ship looked like without planes on it, this hopefully uh, shows the ship the way it should be. I haven't heard anyone yell at me about it yet, so <laughs> I hope it's right. And this was the very first space shuttle they launched in the 70s and it was a huge campaign by the Star Trek fans to name their very first space shuttle Enterprise. And this is what they did, and they did drop test with it. And of course, the, uh, they never used it for launching in space, but it was funny that that show inspired so many people to have the original shuttle named Enterprise. And then this, of course, is the, uh, the Enterprise for the show. We had to do space pods, also in the beginning, which, um, as in Nemesis, you saw the little yellow worker ships. We wanted to go back in time, so everything was kind of bare metal. And the producers, like this, but they thought it was too much like a four-wheel drive truck with all the lights, so they had me strip the lights down, come, kind of come up with a more simplized version of uh, the one you just previously saw. And this was one of the funner projects of the show. The um, costume designer came over and goes, I need help with the spacesuit. And so I kind of helped him work out what they were going to do with these plantons. And it was one of his favorite costumes on the show, too. So this was a great fun thing to work with the costumer, which doesn't happen too often. So breaking out of the our department to do this with him was a, was a great, great privilege to do. And our show has a lot of Vulcan hardware in it. And if you're familiar with the Vulcan stuff, I thought there was a lot more in Vulcan design. The show itself really didn't have any, so we got to start pretty much from the ground up and design what the Vulcans and their architecture was going to look like. And their kind of philosophy on life is it's more logical and more aesthetic as opposed to functional. So we tried to make their ships more a piece of art as opposed to a practical functioning ship. And with this one, we have a kind of an open ring center. And with the CG, you can pretty much add any kind of motion you want. So with this ship, uh, the ring flips forward when it goes to travel into space. And that's kind of their propulsion system. So adding that motion added life to the ship, yet it's still basically a an artistic piece as opposed to functioning. These were some variations of the same ship that they chose from. And this is one of the few examples I brought where it goes through all these different approval, approval phases to get where it's going to go. And as in all space shows, there's always the big spaceship eating ship. And so this was one of the versions we did where it's a big bug ship that kind of <laughs> takes down the Enterprise. And they thought it was a little bit too buggy. 
So we went with this one, which is kind of buggy too, but it didn't have legs, so they, they went with this one as the approval process. And we average seven days per show on a television show. That's from the day we get the script to the day it's done filming. And so we usually do all these drawings the first day to get our approval. And anything goes over two or three days, we're in trouble because all the CG guys have to get to work, all the set designers. So we really try to whip out these drawings as quick as possible. And um, so all these are done pretty much in the first day, first couple of days. And here's a version of a, a tug ship. And with the our producers, they like forward moving ships, things that are long, left to right. And so even though they, the script will read a ship we've never seen before, if you draw it that way, it always funnels down to the same, usually eight or nine different shapes that they really like. If you go into this kind of format, they usually will give you an approval sooner or later. And what you see here is variations on different types of enemy ships and pods and all kinds of stuff like that. So every once in a while they'll want to see uh, uh, scale versions where you see the Enterprise in the background. And I mean, forgot to mention this, but in the beginning, they really liked the blue line drawings that you saw with the shuttles and, and things in the earlier stages. As the show went on, they wanted to see more color, more background. And now this is what they require of me to do, like almost a full kind of color rendering. And so it, it kind of changed very rapidly over the three years we've been on the show already from the blue lines that were much easier to get approved than then going into the full production drawing. So it's kind of fun though, so it's been an education in a way. It's something that I don't do too often. I have a bad trouble with color blindness, so my wife helps me with all the colors. And I go, they want something that's, that's kind of earthy, so she'll help me pick out browns and tans, and stuff that I can't see. <laughs> so, so without her, um, everything would look like this gray. And this is one of our shows where we introduced uh, a character called The Borg. And when we got the script, we went, oh no, they're, they're bringing back something from what the later shows had great success with back to our older show. I want to be in a pretty good story, so. And as far as the board go, they transform what we have into their vessels. And on this ship, this was an Earth ship that goes to the Arctic in, in one of the film's first contact. We blow up one of their board ships and it crashes. And the way the Enterprise series takes off is they carry that story through where it crashed in the Arctic. They go up there, they find these crash ships and they pull some of the characters out of the snow, they thaw out and they take over our ships and kind of the Borg story has a place in Enterprise. And this is what our ship looked like after they had Borgified. It's covered with all kinds of kind of mechanical organics and veins and stuff like that. So this was the version they liked on it and the CG guys took this from there and they elaborately even done it a little bit, took it a little bit further than what I had illustrated it. And so we have a real good working kind of communication, communication that's open between the CG guys and myself and the other artists that come on. And so we all work together and kind of talk back and forth. And this was kind of a fun show. We did a, a flashback show where we're going back to where they're testing earlier ships. This was one of the Warp 3 ships. And we're going to launch it from Edwards, the way the old um, experimental planes took off. And these are variations of the lifting bodies and how the ship was going to get into the atmosphere. There was a quick blue line runway. They let this one go because we were running out of time. Otherwise, they would have had me color it. And there's the final ship. And Klingons, we use a lot of those. And there's one of the ships we had to have a future Enterprise in it, dry dock. And so to help ease this one through, I took our existing Enterprise and just modified it a little bit and put it in an angle where it wasn't really a familiar shot. And they let that one go through. And this was one of my favorites. This was, um, we had to redesign in a retro kind of way, the old Klingon ship from Captain Kirk's time. And so, although we went with this and we built it in the CG form, the producers don't like that ship, so we got this one axed, but it was still a very, very fun one to do. And this is the one they went with. They actually like this one that was in a, kind of further down the line, one of the Star Trek Three movies, The Bird of Prey, which we always constantly have to redo and redraw that one, and it's just a producer's favorite, so that's the way that one went. Here are some of the landscapes that we started doing in this season. We're doing a lot of uh, exterior landscapes. And this is one, one of the shots where we had kind of a mining community and we had these big giant fans kind of keep the air down because everything was subterranean. So these fans kind of designed to pump the air down to the workers below. Here's kind of what we built on set. So the bottom of the structure and the shuttle in the mountain was what we had on stage. And the previous shot was the computer optical. Here's another shot. This is just basically to show how um, the process has changed from the blue line to the color, and this is another version of one of the color drawings. 
and then the Nun version. This was a barge city we designed where uh, the entire community is on an ocean planet. They uh, float on these boats and barges. This was kind of fun when we get to these ruined temples in a, in a cavern. And with any Star Trek show, there's lots of props. And we have a new illustrator we brought on, and he kind of took over the prop role, which was great, because the props usually take the longest time to get approved because they have to be built. They, have, they want to use practical stuff they've already used. So a lot of the props are reused and reused just to save uh, time and money on the construction. And these are just a couple versions of what the props do. And they're back in the time where they use hypos. So it's kind of a future, futuristic type of shot device and the uh, medicine inside of it as well. A little pocket torch. And some microphones. And aside from science fiction, I always like the period pieces. So this is what a movie called The Majestic with Jim Carrey. And this kind of breaks the uh, science fiction mold. I've been doing primarily science fiction since I moved to California in 85. So it's really nice to get a break and get out and do something besides uh, spaceships. There's only so many spaceship shapes, and you sure run out after <laughs> several years. And Star Trek kind of demands anywhere from three to five new ships per episode, so there's not very far to go after a while, so the break usually uh, is a nice thing. And with the Majestic, if, you, if you've seen it, it's, a, it's kind of a remake of the old It's a Wonderful Life. Jim Carrey is a huge Jimmy Stewart fan, so he kind of pushed this one to go through. And we went up to Northern California by Fort Bragg to film. And all the locations were bare corners with the gas stations or banks. And they wanted a period diner. And so the next two or three drawings were diners I, I kind of came up with. And they combined all three of them to make the final diner. So this one was kind of a square version. And here you have the, the train car kind of version of the diner. And the uh, Art Deco version. And mixed together, that's kind of what they came up with. And this was a parking lot for a gas station. And so they rented it for a couple months, built the full interior, and uh, did all the neon work so you have night and day. And this is one of their key locations on the show. Next scene is we had a specific scene where they go to a graveyard and they wanted to make it more personal. It's kind of a war cemetery. And what they built was this little glass case where personal belongings would go. And it was a real key point in the story where Jim Carrey has amnesia, and the town folk recognize him as someone that went away to war and came back. And the whole story wraps around him kind of coming to consciousness of that this is not who he was, but he falls in love with who the people think he is. And so they're trying to convince him of, of his uh, wartime past that never existed. And these are some of the relics that um, the actual character that had died in the war and had. And this cemetery here we built right in the center. It was kind of a bare spot of land. And I couldn't find the drawing to put in, but this is basically what it looked like. We just built the joint in the center of an existing cemetery up on the hill. And they come to a point where they want to unveil a statue. This was kind of fun to do. And we did three versions of the wartime statue. And we had like a kneeling version, um, regards version, just different types of emotions on the uh, soldier's face. This is the one they chose. And they brought in the sculptor that did this entire piece of bronze. It is an immaculate work. And um, it's not displayed as much as you would think it'd be. And that's the sad thing about movies is the things you spend the most time and the hardest work on are the pieces in the film that last the least amount of time. And so as part of the work was on this, it, its screen time was very, very limited. This was a parking lot for a bank where the big building is on the right. That's an actual drive through bank. And they built this building on top of it, built the parking lot with grass to make the park. And the bank was still functioning at this time, but you had to back use the access from the back. And so inside this, this facade, we had this entire functioning bank. And so what you have here is the park and the parking lot. And in the film, this is basically all you got to see. It was another one of those big deals in the production end, but uh, very small on film. And if you ever saw this film, Geppetto, uh, Drew Carey was in love with, Drew, with uh, Geppetto. He wanted to do a show, so Disney, and he came together about three years ago to uh, make a TV movie, Geppetto. And these are some of the interiors. The story was changed slightly from what you saw as the old Pinocchio animated series or animated show. And Geppetto has competition in making children. And so uh, this one particular character made perfect children while Geppetto's Pinocchio is kind of a, a retro version of what they did. And this is the laboratory where the scientists with the perfect children came from. Here's an aerial view 
to kind of see how the set designers would build a set. And I wanted this was too elaborate, too inexpensive, so when it all boiled down to the finished shot, it was in a park, and they had like just some background buildings, but they always start out elaborate and kind of funnel down. And this was Stromboli, Geppetto's kind of puppet competition, and he carried his show in a box. And so it, we designed this crate where the box would open up and have a puppet platform on top of it, as well as being a storage box. And a lot of music boxes we came up with, and this is one of the versions, so it was very, very fun to do. And if you're a John Carpenter fan, I was always a huge fan of his, so I, I fought, fought, fought to finally get on one of his movies. It's probably the worst one ever, but it was the funnest of all the movies I think I've ever worked on. And we came up with this whole kind of future city on Mars, but it's uh, but he wanted to play more like a western. They have the train and the bad guys and the good guys and the and the draw out in town, and so. We, it's basically just a giant western in, in space. And I think John's whole point of view is he makes movies now to do the music. He does all the music for his films. And he's very quiet, very decisive on what he knows on the stage, but in the recording studio, he's a whole different guy. And so, <laughs> so I think the movies are his excuse just to do the music. And this is one of the shows that we actually use practical miniatures. And John's kind of a fan of that. So these guys came up with this show and they did the effects for it. They're Hunter Grasner are the effects guys and they just do these brilliant model shots. And this was the, the entire opening credits was this train going through the Martian surface. And we had to build an interior for all the interior shots. And the train we'd come up with was about, about 70, 80 feet and the interior wound up being 90 to 100. And with this kind of thing you can cheat since none of the two would ever be together. Um, you can pretty much expand a set or contract it however you want. And as long as you never show the two together, exterior and the interior, you have a leeway to go wherever you want to go design-wise. And this is the interior where the pilot sits. And we had to come up with this Martian station called Crises. And this is where an interrogation takes place. Here's a shot where we have the miniature train with the optical of the uh, actual live action people. And the show was kind of fun. It was another small art department. And we got to do the patches, which was kind of fun to do. And there you can see one on the arms of uh, her character was Melanie. This is Natasha uh, Hendricks. And she was, her big break was in the Species movie. She was the Species alien character. She was a lot of fun to work with. And we had an interrogation room. And so this is one of those examples where it's drawn grand. They wanted this big kind of stone room. And after budget say, that's what you got. You got this itty bitty kind of room with a chair and, and a desk. And with John, he is a, sh a shadow guy. I watched all his DVDs before I worked on the show. And he has a commentary that runs with it. And trying to pick out what he likes and what's important to him, it kind of came to me that he's like shadows. And if you can cast a different shadow, that was something he would go for. So I did that with each and every one of the buildings on this uh, kind of Martian street. So each one is different and it shows a different shadow. And here's an example of the previous building. And we had to do um, Martian City and I thought it'd be kind of fun to build it in a crater. And the same thing with the optical. They went with the Martian landscape, put it in the crater. And my wife Tara, who's back here, she wanted to be in the first president, uh, female president on a Martian dollar. So that's her there. And she wasn't happy I had to make her older. I thought she was too young to be a president. So. <laughs> had to wrinkle her up a little bit. And there she is on the dollar bill there. <laughs> and here's some various versions of the architecture that you see around the Martian city. And I kind of to come up with something where it looked like it was molded and dropped. So everything kind of has an adobe look where you did a sand castle box and dropped it in the sand. A little nuclear reactor we had to come up with exterior and interior. And that, we saw that previously, so I got it down there twice. This was the prison, and it was one of the main structures of the film. We had to do a kind of a yard in the back because some of the action takes place back there. And everything was the same color, so again, the shadow was the, the key and important part of the film. I had to do an airlock. They kind of terraformed Mars where it has an atmosphere now, but not that good. And so you still have to go through the airlock to uh, kind of decontaminate. And this is what it looked like. We just glued some vents on a wall and uh, made it really rustic, really dirty. And here was the first sketch combining all the drawings, or all the buildings on this particular street. I had a picture of uh, kind of where my point of view is here, where they were standing and what the hill looked like in the background. So I placed all the buildings according to that. Did a color version of it. And then in the final version, 
pretty much everything lined up the same way. Here we had to do a mine called uh, Shining Canyon Mine. And I drew it very elaborate, very science fiction. And John said, I just want a hole in the ground. So that's what you came up with. <laughs> and so he's so common sense, he just kind of laughed. And what the curse of the movie is, is we are kind of transforming Mars into Earth. We're taking care, taking advantage of the resources. And while they're mining, they, they blow up a wall to continue their mining, and they come across this hole in the side of the wall, or, or on this, this thing that just doesn't look like it belongs. They find this queer opening. Here's what they built on the set. And the whole point of the film is you go in there, the, the Martian kind of philosophy behind it is if technology gets to the point where they can discover this, the curse will be at least to take care of anyone that kind of trespasses on Mars. So they go into this uh, kind of box cave, come across this Martian inscription. And in the script it was a little bit more elaborate. You go to this wall, you go through this door, and you would come across this Martian ball that has text on it. When you touched it, it dissolved into powder, and a wind would blow, and the dust would kind of infect whoever was on the planet, turn them into kind of savages. You'd kill out your own kind, and Mars would be retaken. And budget-wise, they felt that was too much, and story-wise, too much. They took the, the ball version out and only went with the inscription on the wall. So she touches the wall, and it turns to powder, and the, and the uh, curse is released. And we have one scene where we have a balloon come in, hits a kind of a fan and crashes. And John thought that that particular balloon was, was too aerodynamic. He wanted to go with an older balloon. So he went around a balloon, gets cut by the fan and crashes. And what Mrs. Goto was talking about was some of the lithographs that I do for Star Trek. It. And um, this is one of the, that's my little one back there. <laughs> and this is what, I kind of pitched this to the communicator. I thought, wouldn't it be kind of fun to take real history and turn it into a Star Trek history poster? So I kind of came up with this where you have Chuck Yeager's plane, our first space vehicles, and it kind of branches from where we are today up into the Star Trek history. And did the same with the patches below. And when I was doing the painting, that was the hardest thing to find out the earlier patches. A lot of the missions didn't have early patches, so we had to kind of create our own kind patches to fill in the gaps. And so this was a very, very fun one to do. And um, I befriended a, a guy at our local diner, and he did poetry. So I had him write this poet, all kind of for the bottom. And I uh, can't read it here, but it kind of just takes the grandeur of, of creation and imagination and takes it into reality. And after that one, the communicator wanted to do one for Enterprise. So this was the one that followed. And this is the most, most recent one for Nemesis. And it was a lot of fun. It kind of pitched the two ships together. And um, it was just great fun to do these things. It's nice to do a fine art in the middle of a production. And production art is, is very, very fun, very creative. But you're always doing someone else's work. So the lithographs kind of allowed me to break free and do my own versions of things. And if you're familiar with the old movie Flight of the Phoenix, with Jimmy Stewart, where he crashes the plane in the desert, they're redoing it. And I fought very, very hard to get on it. And I found out that being on Star Trek, I was kind of, kind of antiquated. Most pencil artists don't exist anymore. And so breaking out to interview, the first question was, what are your computer skills? And I go, I don't have any. And I still talk my way into letting, them, letting me do some sketches for them. And at that time, I learned that, that almost all the hands-on illustrators are running Photoshop. So they'll do their sketches, and I'll color them in that way. And it's something I'm going to school now to learn myself. So if Star Trek goes, goes down, I can, I can keep working. But anyways, the change of uh, this film from the old one is it takes place in Tibet, Mongolia. And this is one of the opening credit scenes where you, you see some of the Tibetan characters come out of their, uh, their little tents and their structures and you see the, uh, the Phoenix plane fly over. And in the original film, they come across some kind of savage Arab thieves out in the desert. And this was their encampment. And what makes this one different from the older one is they wanted to include a love interest, which the old movie was a, a, an all-male cast. And so there's a, a love interest between the pilot and the air traffic controller, Kelly. And this was early designs for her flight tower. They like this way stacked and put stairs on it. And that was kind of the final version of it. So they wanted to see another perspective on the same point of view. So I dropped it down, gave them a day view, and they wanted to see a night view. And that was the night view version of it. And kind of wrap out 
the slide presentation, this was some of the, the new stuff I'm doing with Edwards Air Force Base. They do these collectibles to celebrate the anniversary of flight. They'll make a logo, they'll print it on, it on an envelope, and the day of the anniversary, they'll postmark it. And it kind of makes a collection piece out of it. So this was just last week, it was the anniversary of Chuck Hayter's breaking the sound barrier and the X-10. So these two drawings were printed on envelopes and uh, they've all been stamped. So I didn't have any to bring, but these were very, very fun to do. I really love the Edwards stuff. So doing anything out there with those guys is a lot of fun. And that's the end of the slideshow.